Okay, so we're going to pick up where we left off last class, which was this discussion of termination. And so I want to go through one of these entire examples um, with all of you, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. So what this would look like is, I have my tablet like lifted up so that it doesn't burn out this time, but then I can't easily work on it. Okay, we'll see if it overheats. Yeah, it's going to do that. Of course it is. So if we're, let's say the question was provide a mechanism. for the monochlorination of ethane. And we were given was this. Uh, I don't know why I wrote two. I'm going to give ethene. So this is precisely what we were just talking about. So again, remember, there are three, potentially four steps to every radical reaction. You need to make radicals from zero to two. You always get two. You never get one. If you had zero, you'd now have two. You need, and that is either initiation or preactivation. Now, where do we draw that line? We're going to come to that. Initiation is when you make a radical that is in the propagation step. So if the radical appears in the propagation step, you are making initiation. Propagation steps are those steps that have one radical on the left-hand side and one radical on the right-hand side of the arrow. So the radical is propagating. Termination steps are when you go from two radicals to zero radicals. So every single radical reaction is made up of initiation, propagation, termination, and a whole bunch. We're going to see this pre-activation stage before initiation. Okay. So in this case, we're going to do initiation. And in that step, we take our chlorine and we treat it with light. And we use a single hooked arrow and we get two chlorine radicals. So we have made two radicals from zero radicals. Propagation. Is when we have one radical on both sides of the arrow. So we have that chlorine radical. And as I said, the most likely thing it's going to do is react with chlorine 2 to make another chlorine radical and chlorine 2. So it's a non-productive step. So we're only going to worry about the productive steps. And so it's looking for the second weakest bond in the entire system because the weakest one gives it its own self back. And that's a carbon-hydrogen bond. It's not the carbon-carbon bond and everything else is a carbon-hydrogen bond. We combine an electron from a carbon-hydrogen bond, we combine a chlorine radical, and we generate a carbon radical. So we've just made HCl plus a carbon radical. Again, just like charges, we're conserving radicals on both sides of the equation. But we're not, you know you're done propagation when you're back to your original radical. And our original radical was chlorine, and now we have a carbon radical. So we're not done because we need to basically do this in a cycle. Propagations need to go in cycles. And so we need to remake that chlorine radical. And we can do that because, again, we were just talking about this, how the least stable bond in the entire system is the chlorine, chlorine bond. So, of course, this is going to find one of those. Why are, so, Mohammed asks, why are radicals so unstable even though they keep the molecule neutral? Um, I think we briefly covered this last class, but just to remind you, it's almost like class number one of the entire course. We had two hydrogen radicals come together and their electrons were in an S orbital. Each of their one electron was in an S orbital. When the two hydrogen atoms made a bond, 
they made a sigma bond, and that sigma bond was lower in energy than the s orbital, than the orbital the radical was in. Bonding, ener bonding orbitals are always lower in energy than non-bonding orbitals that are orbitals that radicals are in. And so it's not so much that the radical is massively unstable, it's just if the radical can make a bond, any bond, it's going to be more stable. So the radicals desperately want to make bonds. So we make our new carbon chlorine bond and we generate our chlorine radical. Now that's where we started. We're good. You're done your propagation. Normally propagation steps do not have more than two rows. I'm, I would say normally and I'm having really trouble coming up. It's not so much normally as I don't, I'm not aware of a single example where there are more than two. It's normally, and the reason for that is there's only one most unstable bond in the system, and that's always going to react. And the only way that you get anything productive is if it's, you know, you break it and you're right back to where you started. Um, if it doesn't do anything. So in this case, there's only chlorine, chlorine bond is the weakest bond in the system. It is always the weakest bond in the system. So occasionally a CL radical reacts with something else, but anything else is going to react with the chlorine, chlorine bond, and that's going to be game over. So you only ever really get two rows in propagation. If you're drawing more than two, you're doing something a little bit wrong. HV is heat. Ah, uh, light, light. HV is light. Delta is heat. Okay, so termination. You terminate by sticking all the bonds to get all the radicals together. So we're going from zero. So this is one radical becomes one radical. That's how you know it's a propagation step. In a termination, two radicals become zero radicals. So, you know, one thing that can happen is two chlorine radicals come together. Another thing that can happen is a chlorine radical and an ethane radical can come together. And that gives us actually our product. But this is not where the product comes from. The product comes from propagation. Like there's a tiny amount formed here, but it's not meaningful. And then we can have two ethane. Radicals come together. To give us butane. So this would be the full mechanism for the monochlorination of that thing. Okay, we're going to do a few more examples today. So I want to just come back and officially have some of these things in the notes because we've glanced over them, we've talked about them, but I don't think we've actually kind of sat on them for a moment. Uh, termination lines are different things that can happen, Nicole. So yeah, there's three different things that can happen. Um, there's actually five because they can all react with the wall, the flask too, but let's, let's ignore that. It's kind of complicated and unnecessary. We'll just pretend they're reacting with this. Yeah, we're just getting rid of the radicals. So kinetics is how fast do reactions go? And you know, it, it, they're pretty simple. The rate of the reaction is a measure of how the concentration of the products increases while the concentration of certain materials decreases. And kinetics are almost always dependent upon the rate or the concentration of materials present. Butane. They made four carbon chain. So the rate law, I know you guys have spent a lot of time on this last year. I'm not going to belabor this. Uh, is a relation between the concentration of the reactions and the observed reaction rate. And it's always determined experimentally. Um, mechanism can give you ideas, but often things are more complicated than the mechanisms we draw. So, you know, you can get <laughs> reactions like this. 
the reaction, the termination step never makes product. You can ignore it. So Victoria asked, in comparison to the propagation step, the termination step makes smaller amounts of products. I wouldn't think of whatever happens in termination as a product. It's, it's, it's part of the mechanism of how you close off the reaction. But you might have a million propagation steps for one termination step. Like whatever is being produced in a termination step is negligible and meaningless. All products are made in propagation. Termination does not lead to products. Products are from propagation. So we can have um, a rate law like this. It looks like it should be, um, you know, second order, uh, first order in A, first order in B, but you don't know. Maybe you need two molecules of A. Maybe one molecule of A activates another molecule of A through a hydrogen bond. Things get pretty complicated. So even simple looking reactions can have more complex rate laws than you expect. But in general, there are rate constant times the concentration to an exponent times another concentration to an exponent, times whatever other concentrations you have in there. And order the, reor, um, the order tends to be the number of molecules of the reactant which is present in a rate determining step of the mechanism. There are some exceptions to this uh, when you have some very, very close rate determining steps. And you can sometimes make things dependent on other things, and so you can get a bit more complexity in that. The activation energy for any reaction, this is EA, we've been calling it, or I've been, I've been often referring to it as energy EA. This is the distance between starting material and transition state. And this value here determines your reaction rate because it's how much energy do you have to get over that hill. The higher your temperature, the more energy you have to get over the hill, the faster the reaction. Always. Reactions are always faster when they're hotter. There are no exceptions to that rule. Yeah, there are no exceptions to that rule. Like unless like your phase change, you need the reaction to occur in a liquid and you boil all the liquid. But then it's not the same reaction anymore, so it's not really a safe comparison. If you can keep the liquid liquid like under high pressure, then it does go much faster. And the activation energy is the minimum kinetic energy needed to cause the reaction. So if we look at an exothermic reaction, we have this activation energy going up from the reactants to the transition state. And the thermodynamic energy, the delta H of the reaction, is the difference between the transition, the starting material and the products. The transition state does not come into it. And remember, thermodynamics are path independent. It doesn't matter how you get to the products when you start material. Starting materials has a given energy state, products are at a given energy state. It doesn't matter what route you take between them. Um, the energies of the reaction, the thermodynamics of the reaction don't care. The kinetics of the reaction care a lot about what route you take between the starting material and the products. So what this leads us to is something called the Hammond postulate. And we discussed this really briefly uh, when we were talking about uh, eliminations and substitutions. So this comes down onto this idea that related species that are similar in energy are also similar in structure. So is that what, why does that matter? The structure of the transition state resembles the structure of the closest stable species. So if you have a transition state, oh, sorry, if you have an exothermic reaction, that means your product is lower than your starting material. It means your, starting, your transition state looks more like your starting material than your product. So that means the bonds that are present in your starting material are more intact in the transition state than the bonds that are present in the product because the transition state looks more like the starting material. In an endothermic reaction, the transition state resembles the product, and that's because it's freaking endothermic. So there's the transition state, there's the product, there's the starting material. Those are close. Those two are going to look similar. They're going to have similar shapes. And what that doesn't so much mean that the product is weird. It means that the transition state, where, you, where that point of no return is, where the reaction goes either forward or backwards, looks a lot more like the product than the starting material. 
Whereas in an exothermic reaction, you have the opposite, where these guys look a lot more similar. And that kind of makes sense. Like in an exothermic reaction, it's a favorable reaction that wants to occur that tells you that your starting material is less stable than your product. So it makes sense that the least stable site of all looks more like the starting material, which is less stable, than it does like the product, which is more stable, and vice versa for an endothermic reaction. So why am I talking about this with halogenation right now? And it's because you get weird stuff happening with these systems. So bromination is endothermic. Normally chlorine and bromine, all these things work very similarly. Here, screw you. The Excuse me, I'm really tired. Um, these carbon radicals are much higher in energy than the bromine radical. Whereas these carbon radicals are lower in energy than the chlorine radical. Now you can get bromination to work because this again is propagation. You just need a lot of energy because these are not the final products. These are intermediates. This carbon radical is not where you're ending. But bromination is comparably hard. Now, there were, for each of those, there were two lines. Oh, I want to just go back for a second. Note that we have two different lines here. And that's because you could have put the radical on ethane and methane. There was only one proton we can strip because ethane is also symmetrical. On propane, we've got two protons we can take off. We can take off a proton on the terminal carbon, or we can take one off on the middle carbon. And what we see in both cases here, both bromine and chlorine, is here we'll take one off the middle carbon. And why is that? Well, it's because radicals act like carbocations. So we've talked about hyperconjugation. Which is stabilized by the inductive effect. That's donation along the bond. And by hyperconjugation, which is donation because this sp3 orbital is more or less in line with that p orbital. We can donate into the carbon plus. So these two effects in carbocations. So in radicals, we see something very, very, very similar. So what is a radical? Generally, that all electrons, electrons going to sit in the p orbital. Why does it do that? Well, let's think about what your choices are. You could have all your orbitals be sp3. So your electrons in an sp3 orbital, everything else is in an sp3 orbital. If that's the case, then your bonds are really on, you say. Um, that means that your ele electrons are in a higher energy orbital. sp3 is a higher energy orbital than sp2. If we put all the electrons into sp2, though, it leaves us with a p orbital with one electron in it. But it's still beneficial to get those other six electrons down to sp2 versus sp3 and leave this electron alone in p than to put everything in a higher level sp3 orbital. So although we're paying a bit of a cost here to have this electron in the p orbital instead of having it in a hybridized orbital, that cost is pretty minimal compared to the energy gain of putting all these guys into sp2s and lower ones. So we have very, very similar kinds of effects where we actually get kind of a hyperconjugation effect with radicals. Because if we think about it, let's say there is another carbon here and it's got two electrons in it interacting with the hydrogen. 
one of these electrons can kind of jump over here because it's now lined up. So we can delocalize one of these electrons into this empty, this half empty p orbital stabilizing it. So these electrons can jump around if there are sp3s lined up next to it. They don't tend to, they tend to stay in the bond because as soon as they do that, if you lose an electron from this, you don't have a bond anymore. The hydrogen starts drifting off, the electron jumps right back and performs the bond because you don't want the radical. But the more of these interactions are present, the more you stabilize that p orbital. And so radicals are stabilized the same way as carbocations. There's going to be one, uh, one good exception to this rule. So, the most stable radical are tertiary, the least stable are methyl. No, there's no um, radicals in SN2, E1, E2, or SN1. So, but we can also stabilize them through resonance, just like a carbocation would be. Except now, of course, you need to use that radical to draw resonance. And so your radicals, are, your resonance arrows are all radical arrows. And again, partial radical, partial radical. Um, of course, that really makes no sense. So I, I don't love this nomenclature. What I prefer to draw is that saying there's a radical delocalized around those sites. Because you don't have a partial radical. You just have the electron kind of not localized. And this is kind of a curvy outline. And that will be the resonance hybrid of the radical system. Okay. So one of the biggest things that radicals do is polymerize. And this is basically the entire basis of our economy is plastic. And it's all radical polymerizations. So we're going to talk about how you go about getting this to work. And there's a bunch of ways. This time... I'm going to show two different types of radical polymerizations. I'm going to show a chlorine mediated one and then a really modern one that's actually how we actually do it. So what you might do for this is you might take, I don't know, Teflon. No, you know what? We'll do acrylonitrile. It's what nitrile gloves are made of, um, sort of uh, med medical gloves. Makes up a whole lot of other things. Catalytic chlorine. So just a tiny bit of chlorine. I mean tiny. Like normally one part per million kind of thing or one part per 10 million. And some light. And this is why we like radical chemistry so much is because you almost need no reagents. There's no solvent. You just take acrylonitrile, you shine material, you add a tiny, tiny drop of chlorine, you shine some light on it, and you basically turn all your acrylonitrile into polyacrylamide. And you don't end up with any This is an acrylonitrile. Anyways, this thing. This is what makes nitrile gloves. Um, you don't end up with any waste from this process. It's a waste-free process, and of course. Industry loves waste-free processes because they're cheap. Because you don't throw anything out. And what this is going to do is it's going to give us a polymer. So 
This is polymer notation. So what I've done is I put a bracket around a repeating unit. And I've, I'll put a uh, little N here to represent number of repeats. Unless it's defined, the number of repeats is always N, which just stands for lots. Okay, so we use for commercial polymers on the order of about 1,000 or uh, 1,500 for a lot of these. Gets too long, the uh, material starts becoming really brittle. So, how does this work? Okay, so for initiation, well, this is actually one of these cases where we are going to have preactivation because the chlorine is not really going to be in our propagation step. So, and I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that. So, we're going to do a preactivation step. We're going to take chlorine, we're going to shine light on it. And we're going to get two chlorine radicals, just like we just did. Nothing special there. Chlorine radicals look around for the weakest bond available. It's still chlorine. So they're looking for chlorine, but there's really not very much chlorine in there. So it's most like, and you don't need to label these yet. You might not want to label them yet, because you might not be able to see by inspection what is initiation, what's preactivation. You can kind of stick these labels in later is the chlorine radical is going to react with the polymer. Okay. So this is where radicals get a little bit different from carbocations, and now they act like carbanions. You would not really want to put a positive charge there. You would put it at secondary site, but you've got this bad resonance that's going against it. It's kind of like putting it next to a nitro group or next to a CF3 group. It's electron drawing. It's not a good place to put a carbon charge. But it's a great place to put a radical. And that's because radicals are not carbocations. Remember, radicals do resonance. Often they benefit from the same thing carbocations benefit from. Not always. And here we can sort of see the difference. So this is a sort of a sidebar. Just to keep track of why the radical gets generated where it does. Dot means carbon. So a dot in the middle there means a carbon. And so if that was a carbocation, we'd have a positive charge and I should now be awful. This is okay. Nothing really wrong with it. It's a little weird having carbon with dull bonds going off in both directions, but that actually is a thing. Um, pretty reactive thing, but still a thing. And so we have resin stabilization. Whereas if we had put the radical on the other side, we would have had a primary radical with no resonance and primary radicals suck. So this is where radicals do things that carbocations wouldn't you probably wouldn't actually have a reaction with this molecule um, with H plus or something. You just wouldn't make a carbocation. It wouldn't react because it's no good place to put it. But very, very reactive for radicals because of this resonance. Okay. In your propagation step, we're going to take the radical that we made. And we're going to add the thing that there's a million of. There's really not much chlorine sitting around. And 
And so it makes a bond and it sticks the radical into the same place again. And now we actually only have one propagation step here. We can do another line if we like, but it's exactly the same thing. It's a radical alpha to a cyanide attacking um, no, it is a acrylonitrile, attacking acrylonitrile. So there's only really one propagation step. This goes onwards and onwards and repeats and repeats and repeats again and again and again. And what we end up with is a polymer. And note that the repeating subunit is that. You always have a lot of those. Okay, how does this terminate? Well, it reacts with either another radical or it can react by something called disproportionation. I'm going to create a new slide. Because polymers are so long, like one termination is chlorine radical plus chlorine radical gives you Cl2. We like that one. Another one is you could have a polymer Yeah, that's one possibility. Uh, good eyes, Bennett. Thank you. I'm a moron. Yes. Another possibility is, um, Amar called it. Two radicals come together. Something a little satisfying about this, about sort of the parallelism of it. Now, what doesn't tend to happen is two of the big polymer chains coming together because they're big polymer chains and holy shit, they're big. So what tends to happen instead is it could be either the polymer chain or it could be the chlorine radical. I'm gonna just rework where I put the bracket here and you'll see why in a second. And I'm just going to say radical. I want to write any radical and just start writing N. We're going to steal the hydrogen, the alpha hydrogen. It's almost like an E2 radical elimination. We're taking the radical adjacent to it. It's almost like an E1, actually. It's almost like you're taking the radical, the hydrogen adjacent to a carbocation. This is called disproportion. Nation. Which is a long word. Come and look, I never thought of it as a long word, but that is a long word. That's a lot of letters. So the overall idea here is that we can use another radical to basically do an E1 elimination. It's not E1, it's E1 like.
but for radicals. Which is kind of radical. But in the end, we make these polymers. And so here, we only had the one real propagation step because the weakest bond was the one that generated the radical. We didn't have to go around with this whole chlorine, carbon, swapping things out thing. We just had one. So this underlies, yeah, our civilization. And if you want to read, more, there's more problems about this in Andrew asks, the slide before, why does it have H bonds on the ends of the polymer notation? I shouldn't have any H bonds. Oh, up, up the top there. I just drew hydrogens um, because it could be. I don't know. That's where the hydrogens came from. I guess, you know, we can correct this to an uh, because normally we don't care about what's at the end because the end are so small compared to the polymer in the middle. It's really irrelevant what's on the end. But let's say it's two chlorines. But we don't normally worry about that. Uh, it says E1 like, but for radicals. Okay, so there's more problems in the assignments with this to practice it. There's not. There's a lot of stuff which is more complicated. Uh, we'll do one more example. Um, but I'll get to anti Markovnikov, and then we'll come back and do one more example of chlorinations. As for the polymers, there's nothing complicated about them. There's a monomer, and you polymerize it. The only hard thing is you need to figure out where the radical goes. And that's based on either resonance or hyperconjugation. And resonance is better, as always. For the monohalogenation, it's based on where you want the radical to go. What's the most stable proton to remove? And we saw, or a hydrogen atom, sorry, it's not a proton, we're removing a hydrogen atom, we're removing the hydrogen and its electron. And what we saw was that the secondary were better than the primary, a tertiary would have been better than the secondary, resonance would have been better than all of them. Uh, nope, there's still, oh, nope, nope, there should be an N. I just forgot to put the N in. Yeah. Thank you, Amar. I get so caught up in what I'm trying to say that I forget what I'm writing. Okay. Not really, Anita. You can put it's at it like if the repeating unit is two carbons and this one is, it doesn't matter where you say it. And that's why I moved it around, because I wanted to highlight that I could remove that hydrogen at the end. So it doesn't, so Anita asks, does it matter which two carbons you put in the square brackets? No, it doesn't. What you do need to make sure is that you have something on the ends. Okay, so as promised, we're gonna come back to anti markovnikov editions of HBR. So we're gonna walk through the mechanism here. But what we've got is Preactivation. So here what they're using is like benzoyl peroxide. We'll, we'll do an example with AIBN. We have preactivation. We have a peroxide. You add heat. You make two peroxy radicals. Then we have initiation. Where it reacts with some HBr to generate a bromine radical. Because halogen radicals are... if. If there is a stable radical out there, it's a halogen radical. As far as radicals go, they're pretty happy. Hydrogen radicals suck. And it's not an electronegativity thing. It's a... It's a bond association energy thing. Where halogen bonds to other things tend to be weak. So if the halogen is attached to anything and you're gonna break that bond and you're gonna attach either end to something else, you're gonna attach the thing that isn't a halogen to something else because whatever it is, is gonna make a stronger bond than the halogen will. Halogens make weak bonds, which means they're the most likely thing to become radicals because whatever they were attached to is more likely to be involved in a bond. And the halogen is the least unhappy when it's not involved in a bond.
Uh, it was initiation and one before that because the radical generated in the initiation step was used in propagation. So if the radical generated, the in initiation, the radical generated is in propagation. And so if that radical doesn't show up in propagation, then it was an initiation. Initiation initiates propagation. So in this case, the bromine radical does show up in propagation. So here's the propagation step of the addition of HBr to the bond. Again, Br dot goes around. The most weak, the weakest bond in the molecule is in the whole system is bromine hydrogen. And of course, 99.999% of the time, it does that, which of course gives us bubkis because we recover exactly what we had before the arrow. So nobody cares. So we care is when it reacts with the other weaker, second weakest bond. Which unsurprisingly is the P bond, or the pi bond. And we've talked about that because pi bonds are always higher in energy than sigma bonds. So it makes sense that in this molecule, this ethane molecule, ethene molecule, the weakest bond is the double bond. So the bromine reacts and it generates a radical. And note that this is symmetrical, so it doesn't freaking matter. It says more substituted carbon, but both those carbons are equally substituted. So it's the same thing, it's symmetrical. Then, now we generate a carbon radical. That's gonna to react to the weakest thing around, which is HBr, still is, hasn't changed. And again, we're gonna generate a bromine radical because halogen radicals don't suck as much as every other type of radical. And so we can draw the arrows and we abstract the hydrogen from HBr. I'm gonna use this terminology. Hydrogen abstraction is a nice way to say you stole H dot. And that's exactly what we've done. We've stolen H plus it's a lot electron, so H dot. Then this is propagation because we are back to where we started. And we can now do another cycle of this. Okay. So let's think about what this means for one of our assignment questions. Okay, so what you did know is that sorry, yep. Yeah. All good? Yeah. We're on the home stretch here. Seven minutes left. Let's see if we can do this. You know what? What I'll do is I'll get through the pre-activation and I'll leave the rest of it as an assignment for homework. Because you don't can't possibly have enough homework. Anyways, so what we did know is that when we're doing this with just HBR and heat, like no radical, you're going to generate the carbocation. You guys have labs? No, you don't have labs anymore, do you? Labs are over, right? I have a very important meeting at 2.30. And I can't even say that with a straight face. What we generated was the rat, like, with, with the carbocation, let's just, okay, 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 we'll run over, I'll do the whole damn question. The whole point with this is just remember the really good resonance structure you get. Is that, so if you're going to do chemistry with HBr or something, you're going to want to put your carbocation down here. 
See, it does. It do. Yeah, this is AIBN. I don't know. No, there's no lab test or exam. The lab has sucked up enough of your life. I know it doesn't feel like it, but you actually got off easy. Writing these lab reports for this course is always tough, and we're trying to rework that and get rid of them. But it's a long, slow fight. Um, so you get, yeah, yeah. You know, as part of the whole undergraduate education is you come in as enthusiastic, motivated students. And what we do is we suck your soul out and then we try and replace it with something else. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So sometimes you just come out of a soulless husk. Yeah, it is. And we're going to actually just, we're going to draw that. I'm, I'm just getting distracted by soulless husks. So what we want to do is, yeah, if we're lucky, we'll replace it with science. I was happy once. Okay, so <laughs> still pretty happy. Well, when just remember how we would do this. If there was a carbocation, you would make this guy. And I know a lot of you had trouble with this question because I know I answered a lot of times in class and the whole reason is we're gonna discuss it here. Okay. Now, question B on that thing said, just do the opposite. Trust me, do the opposite. I'll tell you the mechanism later. Well, it's later. I'm right at the top of my zoom window and I can't draw. There's a carbonyl up there and I can't draw it because my zoom window is, oh, that's all, fix it. No, that should have worked. Okay, there we go. Okay. So how does this work? Well, reactivation. So this whole AIBN secret thing, it's not really that secret. You could look it up, like a quick Google foo and you, you get the answer. But is this and so you probably heat and what does it want to do well something that should jump out at you is a little weird about this molecule is you've got this nitrogen double bonded to a nitrogen and those of you with a passing interest in explosives which hopefully is most of you because explosives are cool um, most explosions occur because things want to become nitrogen gas. Making nitrogen gas is a really good way to make things go boom. So let's make some nitrogen gas. That up arrow just means it escapes. So you create nitrogen gas. This is automatically really exothermic. Nitrogen gas is like what nitrogen wants to be when it grows up, right? All nitrogen wants to become nitrogen gas. It's the most stable form of nitrogen. And so that's awesome. It's also entropically really favored because you just created gas in two molecules and it's really, really good. Well, you create three molecules from one molecule and one of them is a gas. So entropically, this is like massively, your delta S term is really favorable. Your delta H term is really favorable. This is really favorable. Um, it's just the reason why we use AIBN, not something else, is, well, this radical is stabilized by the cyanide group. We just saw that when we were polymerizing acrylonitrile. So it's the same radical react, um, resonance structure. If we put in a much better radical stabilization group there, you can't make the AIBN equivalent. It blows up before you can do anything to it because it just really, really wants to become that radical and release nitrogen gas. So AIBN is this compromise between a molecule which doesn't tend to blow up when you're shipping it across the country, um, but does kind of disintegrate to give you radicals when you heat it to about 65 degrees Celsius. That's kind of the magic number. You can go, uh, normally we run these at about 80 because we're crazy, but 
um, or it's more fun and the reaction goes faster. But 65 seems to be the trigger point. If you heat solid AIBN up to about 80 degrees, it does detonate, which is not ideal. Now, it's pre-activation because this radical is not involved in the propagation steps. We have made two radicals from zero radicals, but the radical is not involved in the propagation steps. And how do we know that? There's no, there's no AIBN attached to this product. There's a freaking bromine and a carbon chain. There's no AIBN there. So this thing cannot be in there. But you can take HBr and that starting material and heat it, and you're not going to get radicals. You'll do the thing we have on the far right. So you need this radical initiator. So this is called a radical initiator. Why? Because it initiates radicals. Okay. Now an in initiation... Hey, look, it's going to look for the weakest bond. Isn't that exciting? Oh, fuck. <laughs> um, no, I see, I'm still there. I just realized this is the example where I did need to correct the starting material product because normally you get the opposite, but with the resonance with the ketone, you don't. Okay, so you're going to get the same product this time. We'll see why. I saw a different reason, but we're going to get the same product. With all the, the I'm going to come back and uh, do I want to do this one? Yeah, I started this one. I'm going to live with my, my mistake, and I'm going to go back and correct that problem set because I got too clever. It works most of the time, but not with the carbonyl one because of what's going to happen next. So you get a bromine radical. Ah, oh, damn it. That's what happens when you write questions. You don't really revisit them, and then you go, oh, that's a mistake. And I make this mistake every year, and I discover it about this point every year, and I go, I need to fix that, and I forget to fix it every single year. Oh, well. So this is going to react with this double bond, and how does it do it? We make the most stable radical. Now, this is the reason I want to talk about this example, but my answer is wrong. And that's that this radical is stable because it can do something a carbocation can't do. It can act kind of like a carbanion. So just keep in mind that you can do this resonance. That's okay. And if I put the radical on that side, I can do that. If I put the radical on the other side, I can't. And that oxygen is neutral because if I count the bonds, it's got two lone pairs and a single electron and a single bond. It's neutral. So This is looking around for the weakest bond around, which is still HBr, because HBr is always the weakest bond around. Yeah, this is correct.
curiosity, Bennett, why 2.376? Okay, good answer is any. Yes, this is all, um, that was initiation. This is propagation here. You're absolutely right. Uh-oh. Sorry, yeah, I got all excited about initiation between pre-activation initiation, and I forgot the pro propagation step. We're generating a radical as it's turning over. So we generate a carbon radical or an oxygen radical, and then that reacts with HBr to regenerate the bromine radical. And now that can react with another um, equivalent of the starting material. Termination then is combine any of the any of the radicals anyway. I'll leave that as an exercise because my tablet is about to overheat. Where this does work, an example we're going to start next class with. We'll do benzoyl chloride. Heat. Just a reminder for the Markovnikov versus anti-Markovnikov. So I'm not showing termination steps here because I don't care. Um, what's this? Oh, this one here, uh, benzoyl peroxide. These are pHs for phenyl. So if you look in the assignments, there are a lot of these radical activators. The only two I'm using are benzoyl peroxide. Oh, HBr. There's this, there's HBr, there's AIBN. What is that? Um, it's a decanone. Is it acne cream? It might be. I have no idea. It's just a molecule. It's a pretty easy one to make, so I'm not surprised that it gets used for something. Actually, be um, these are actually really dangerous as drugs because they are covalent inhibitors and they'll tend to bind to anything and just make covalent bonds. No, I don't think it's anything special. Might be, though. Decinone, cyclodecinone, decalinone, decalinone. I have no idea. I'm sure it does have a name because it's a pretty straightforward system. Yeah. You can name it. I just don't care. Okay, I think that's where we're going to leave it today. And we're at 2.30, so we're only 10 minutes over, which isn't all that bad when Paul being judged. Uh, I'm going to upload this, and I'm going to upload these slides. And Oh, you know what? We'll finish off this thing, and we'll have one more example next class. But I'll just finish this off so that I can like post these slides, and then they're complete, and I'll give some new slides. So free radicals or orbitals occupied by a single electron? Check. Hook arrows? Check. There are three steps. Sometimes four. Initiation, propagation, termination. The product always comes from propagation. Uh, we covered three different mechanisms. Polymerization, halogenation of alkenes, and anti-Markovnikov addition. Halogenation of alkenes does exactly what 
the basically like the anti Markovsky comp, except you have two bromines on both sides. So I guess you can add bromine Br2 using ionic or Br2 using radical, and you get the same product, and it's very similar. And then the Hammond postulate helps us predict the structure of transition states. Um, it's good. It's a good idea that you've heard of the Hammond postulate because it will come up in later courses. But we're not really going to be using it to make a lot of decisions in this course. There are lots of practice problems. Um, there are more practice problems, I think, on assignment four. At this point, we've now covered the material for the course. So what we're really going to be doing now for the next bunch of lectures, we're going to go back and do a few more examples of radical reactions. And then we're going to work through a few multi-step syntheses and something called retrosynthesis. We're trying to sort of use the tools we have now to solve some puzzles and to solve how we can go about making molecules. Okay. I will see you guys on Wednesday. Have a really good rest of the day.